Hello and welcome to another lecture from the Department of Neuroimaging at King's College London. This talk deals with how we can understand the link between brain neurobiology and behavior, both in health and brain disorders, with particular attention to complex psychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia. More specifically, here at Neuroimaging, we can use imaging modalities such as positron emission tomography to measure in vivo a number of physiological parameters, such as the densities of certain neuroreceptor systems, and we can monitor their changes in disease. At the same time, we can use other modalities such as functional MRI and EEG to measure brain activity. However, what is really difficult to do is to understand how the changes in neurobiology impact brain function and ultimately they impact behavior and its disorders. Now the only way we can do this is by building models. Models really are theories. These theories have great explanatory power and they can link seemingly disparate observations obtained at different scales with qualitatively different instrumentations in disparate experimental conditions and patients' populations. Models also allow to measure testable predictions. Models are the most important products of scientific efforts and they are key to determine the experiments, the technologies and also the analytics. If you're interested, the slide shows a very good book from David Dolch on the topic. Now, so how can we model the propagation of brain signals from the basic observables of neurobiology to the macro observables of brain function and behavior? Let's start with a slide that shows an observation obtained with functional MRI. Functional MRI measures brain activity as the local changes in oxygenation required by neuronal function because they are caused by changes in the oxy versus deoxy hemoglobin concentrations that generate a magnetic signal which is captured by the scanner. Hence, we can follow brain activity through time and observe its changes in, say, 10, 15, 20 minutes experiments with a time of resolution of about 2 seconds. We can do this when the subject is doing a task or when the brain is at rest. The latter kind of experiment is called resting state fMRI. Now, what we can do with this resting state fMRI data is to calculate the correlation between the time activity of voxels across the brain at increasing distances. And we can see that on the left panel. The correlation function here is plotted against the log of the distance. And look how linear this is it drops down until we reach distances that are more or less the diameter of the skull when obviously the relationship breaks down. However, if we do that not just across space, but if you do that across time points, which you can do very quickly with the fast Fourier transform, we observe the same linear relationship. And this is, we can see on the right panel. Now, what is even more interesting is that the same phenomena we can observe and it, the relationship appears linear with any other instrumentation, whether we use EEG or MEG, or we look at very uh, small scales, like we can do with cellular electrophysiology. This linear relationship is very important because it is the unmistakable fingerprint of a fractal object. Fractal objects are characterized by self-similarity, and self-similarity is actually very common in nature. On the top of the slide, there is a line of photos of self-similar natural objects. From left to right, we can see a brain microscopic image, trees in a park, this is a picture I took while I was trying to avoid social contact with my kids' school friends' parents. And then we have the custom Finland, another brain image of brain vasculature, 
another image of brain tissue and then what we can see there is a false color image of the Nile, the river. Fractal objects require a special geometry, fractal geometry. And one important thing of fractal geometry is one parameter called fractal dimension. The fractal dimension tells you how well an object fills a space. If it's a two-dimensional object, then the maximum will be two. If it's a three-dimensional object, the maximum will be three. It can be calculated as the ratio between the number of newly generated objects at each iteration divided by the object's size. And you can see two examples there. Let's talk about the brain then. The brain is a fractal object and has a fractal dimension, which is 2.8, as it has been measured a few times. In disease, this dimension changes, and fractal geometry has been demonstrated as a far more sensitive tool than classic geometry to measure differences in brain structures in disorders such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Okay, that is for the structure, but what about the function, which is something we are really interested in? But in order to understand the self-similarity, we need to understand what is the basic organization of the brain. The elementary uh, functional circuit is not what we expect to be, which is one neuron. It's actually two. The first element is the so-called pyramidal or excitatory neuron, which on the left panel you see as a triangle. And on the right panel you see a pyramidal, or actually two pyramidal neurons, going up, uh, down, or actually bottom up, from the cortex deep down up to the surface. This type of neuron uses glutamate as an excitatory neurotransmitter. And then there is the other, the second element, which is the interneuron, or so-called parvalbumin interneurons, as they are indicated as PV on the left panel, and they are circular. They appear on the right side as some sort of ramified blurs, which you can see at the cortical layers 2 and 5. Interneurons, instead, are inhibitory and they use the neurotransmitter GABA. They combine with pyramidal neurons to form a feedback circuit. Now, to show how this feedback works, I have manufactured a wave generator using some barbecue sticks, tape, as you can see there, and jelly babies. You can see the jelly babies? Now, so how do you generate a wave? Each stick is a little circuit, and when there is excitation, the sticks go up. I then inhibit immediately by putting the stick down. Once you create an excitation inhibition sequence, you generate a wave, as you can clearly see. Now, the frequency of the wave oscillation will depend on the delay between excitation and inhibition. Pavalbumin neurons react pretty quickly, so that the basic frequency of brain signals is about 80 Hz, and these are called gamma waves. The excitation inhibition action does not just work on time, but also in space. GABA interneurons, as you can see from the slide, also fire laterally, inhibiting the side neuronal columns. This is well known in primary cortices, and what this does, it helps increasing the selectivity of the sensory perception. And increasing the discriminatory capacity of, say, visual cortex or any other sensory cortex. In order to understand better lateral inhibition, I'm using here two panels with distinctively different colors, one brighter and one darker. 
When I place side by side the two panels, you will perceive, first of all, a white line running in the middle, as well as a darker band on the light grey side and the darker lines on the light grey panel. These bands do not really exist. They are just illusions created by lateral inhibition in your eyes. So, I hope that with my two demonstrations I have convinced you that the brain elementary units, the two neurons, are equivalent to three-dimensional oscillators, both in time and in space. That's fine, but how these oscillators communicate with each other? How is information integrated to generate the full perceptual experience? Well, in order to do that, basic oscillators need to do two things. First of all, they need to synchronize, so they need to get to oscillate together. That's how they communicate information. But they also have to desynchronize quickly afterwards because they need to synchronize with other oscillators, so that communication is passed along the brain. So how do biological oscillators synchronize? Synchronization is a very difficult thing to do. Take these two metronomes that are standard mechanical oscillators. It takes a lot of my intervention to make them run in synchrony and they can get out of synchrony very quickly. So it's a tough job to do. However, there is a little trick. I take a board, a study board, quite rigid and two empty cans. In this way, I can create a small transfer of energy from one to the other, and I can get them into synchrony very, very quickly. This is also called, as far as the brain is concerned, bottom-up synchronization, and is a natural process by which thousands or hundreds of thousands of oscillators can form synchronized units. If I we then add another oscillator, say with a different frequency, what happens is that the oscillator will be forced for some time into oscillating at the same frequency of the other two. And then for a moment then it will escape. This is called top-down, which is where large brain areas force into synchrony smaller computational units. Now imagine the brain is made of large and small oscillatory units. They get into and out of synchrony with each other, creating a whole envelope of frequencies and outputs. Because of the delays into communication across the brain, where larger areas exhibit lower waves and smaller areas, which are closer together, exhibit faster uh, frequency ranges, then we can have a whole distribution of frequency outputs. Now, so we hopefully understand that the brain is made of oscillators, that they get synchronized and they get desynchronized, and depending on size and distance, they create a whole range of frequency outputs. Now, because the brain grows into some sort of self-similar shape, they then exhibit the typical self-similar line outputs across frequency and across times. Now, I've not answered the big question, which is why is it developing in a self-similar fashion? Well, the answer is very easy. It's evolution, because self-similar functional systems are optimal for information processing.
but now how is this model useful well let's see how this multi-scale self-similar model makes predictions the first prediction concerns a particular large network we are interested in which is the default mode network this network is supposed to decrease activity when the brain attends to external inputs while its activity goes up in occasion of any internal monitoring activity so where does this network come from nobody really knows however the model of cell similarity across scales makes a very precise prediction and this prediction is that every time or spatial behavior we notice at the finest scale we must observe at the larger scales hence the default mode network cannot be but the great scale equivalent of lateral inhibition. Every time a large sensory area activates, the conjugate areas will be suppressed. Is this true? Well, if this is true, by selecting specific sensory tasks, what we can predict is that only the default mode areas that are closer to the activations, to the sensory activations, will be suppressed. And this is exactly what we observed. We took two different tasks, a motor task and a visual task. In both instances, the areas that deactivated, blue and light blue, are those that are closer to the area, to the respectful area, that is functionally activated in the two tasks. Now let's move to a second uh, application which is schizophrenia schizophrenia is a very complicated or complex disorders which is genetically heritable but where environmental stresses seems to also to play a big role at the molecular level there is a lot of genetic and molecular evidence that has been hard to put together into a cohesive narrative for this disorder however the genes and environmental risks all seem to point to pervalbumin neurons as the point of convergence for this disorder. But how does an interneuron disorder is reflected into brain function? Let's start with the micro scale, which is here. The micro circuit model presented here as our multi scale hypothesis predicts disturbances both in the time and space feedback loops and indeed EG anomalies are very evident in these disorders particularly in the gamma power in all patients with schizophrenia and as far as space is concerned the model also predicts that lateral inhibition shall also be affected and as a matter of fact whether it's visual, auditory or olfactory, schizophrenics do have problems with discrimination across different inputs. So what about the microscale? Well, the model predicts that because there are issues with the generation of the basic gamma waves, there will be issues of connectivity across all scales and across all networks at all scales and indeed schizophrenia has been defined as a disorder of brain connectivity but lack of lateral inhibition is also very important because it is then reflected in the malfunction of the default mode network which then translates in the poor ability of schizophrenics to switch from external to external activities Hence, we can explain the delusions that these patients have as the inability of distinguish between internal and external activities. So, computational models like this are very powerful because they allow us to project brain neurobiology into large functional signals. We can link neurobiology with the 
observables of fMRI and EEG, for example, which is interesting, but could be a pointless exercise because we, we are really after is not just brain activity. What we are really after is the interaction between brain and environment, which we call behavior. So how can we go about that? Well, our current research program uses computational models that are implanted on the human brain connectome for realistic outputs. And we can use this to link neurobiology and big functional signals. But we've done something more. We transmit these signals to a human avatar. The avatar lives in an environment and this allows us to study the emergence of behavior directly from bio biology through computational models. And finally, let me thank all those that were involved in this research. Tony Vernon and Paul Expert at King's College, Peter Hellier and Rob Leach, and Harry Jensen at Imperial, and Lou David Lord at Oxford. Thank you very much for listening.